Last week, uh, we were talking about uh, a course that I gave at the University of Cape Coast course on embedded systems. And now the second lecture is going to be on a new course, which, which is going to be on the Internet of Things. Again, a course which is uh, supposed to be run at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. Well, my name is Uli Reich. I was working at CERN for 35 years. I'm now sort of retired, but as you see, I'm still quite active. Here's my email address for anybody who wants to contact me. So when I was in Cape Coast and I left uh, Cape Coast, then I talked to my colleagues and uh, African colleagues and asked them what they wanted to change on, on the embedded discourse. And one of the things that they said is that they would like to actually port the, the whole course from the C language to Python. Because they said that Python is a language that is uh, more repanded in, in, uh, in their universities, so people are more comfortable with it. And so what I did, uh, I started to port the very first exercises. Well, you have to know that uh, when I started to do that, I had never ever written a single Python program in my life. So it's really uh, a beginning for, for me also. I had to do, do a lot of learning to try and get uh, comfortable with Python as well. Now, my colleagues then promised that they would maintain and up, an upgrade the laboratory. So we have some 15 uh, stations in the laboratory. And uh, of course, a laboratory will only work if you permanently maintain and upgrade it. Otherwise, it will die in very short time. They also promise that they're going to port the whole course, the slides, the exercises, solutions, and everything to the Python language. And they promised to develop new exercises with solutions, some, some small projects for the lab, and so on. So now almost three years have gone by. And unfortunately, essentially nothing has happened. Now, in 2018, uh, my colleague there, he wanted already to do the porting, and he wanted to do the, the course in 2018 in Python. So when I saw that in August there was still not a single slide was written, then I said, well, this is going to be very short. And uh, shortly before the course, he said, no, I'm going to do what you have done. And he took my slides as they were. He took the exercises and solutions as they were. So, so it was really a Chinese copy, slightly stripped down from what I had done myself. But this is how I gave, yeah, how he gave the course. And in 2019, nothing happened. So after my departure from Cape Coast, my, the, uh, the Ghanaian professor who actually pulled all the strips of my visit there in the background, he invited me for, to, to animate two-day workshops on IoT. We'll talk about IoT in a second. At the yearly Internet Summit, the African Internet Summit. Now, these workshops were actually already based on Python. And so when going through the exercises of the Embedded Systems course, looking at them in more detail, uh, I asked myself, why should we not actually change the course a little further and go for an IoT course? So in addition to the sensors, actuators, and so on, try to bring everything up on the, on the web. Okay, so I tried to start um, creating a new course on the Internet of Things instead of the embedded system course that based on Python that we had before. Now, what are the differences between the two courses, the embedded systems and the IoT course? Now, the first thing to say is what will stay the same. Now, I think the uh, documentation, having all the documentation on the web and having it uh, easily accessible, easy, easily modifiable. Now, this was actually a very, very good thing. And we decided to, to continue like this. So if you have a look at, at uh, this site here. So this is now the description of the, of the courses. And here you will see 
the UCC University of Cape Coast course in 2020. Well, what you are seeing here is actually served from a machine in Ghana. And here now you see all the documentation for the course. So the introduction, explanation of the hardware, something about the Python interpreter, how to write scripts, how to have to internet access, and so on. So all the different uh, devices that we have, serial ports, GPS receiver, ADC duck, and so on and so on. And here you will find all the different exercises. So these are 12 exercises that you want to do for each of the exercises will take about four hours to, to complete. Now the slides, the slides for the moment show you this, no slides yet, because I believe that the slides can only be written by the person who delivers the course. So this is not done yet. On the other hand, you have the solutions so there are explanations about the solutions. Some of them, the red ones, are not, not yet written. However, the, um, the, the solutions, the, the code is already there. So I said about what is going to change. So we will change now the programming language from C to Python. And all the demonstration programs, exercise solutions, and so on, they are available on GitHub now. So if you go onto the GitHub page, then you will see here you find the exercise solutions. So here are the, the problems, are the, the problem sheets. They are all in, in uh, LibreOffice uh, format. So you can download them and, and print them out. And here are the solutions. So here you find the solutions for all the different exercises. You see all the different type, uh, Python programs that you can download and then run on the hardware that we have. So all, all the exercises, uh, all the solutions to the exercises are there. Okay. Now, another, prob another difference is going to be that in the embedded systems course, we actually did all the development of the programs natively on the Raspberry Pi. Now with the hardware we are going to use for the IoT course, it is not possible. So what we were going to do is to actually develop everything on a PC, then upload it to the microcontroller and then execute it. Uh, in addition to the hardware we had for the embedded systems course, we have quite a bit more now. We have, in addition, a DC motor, a servo motor. We still have a stepping motor as we had before. We have a GPS receiver, we have TSD displays. Some sensors have, have been removed and others have been added. And the most important thing is that in addition to the uh, sensors and, and, uh, and actuators, now we have also lectures on the internet facilities and protocols. So how can we actually uh, send the data that we read out from our sensors onto the internet and pick them up from there. So what is IoT? Now, if I ask people what IoT was, then I get the answer, IoT is the internet of things. Well, that is perfectly true. The only problem is, what is the internet of things? So I myself, I hate very much, much, much uh, buzzwords. So buzzwords are things that people just talk about without really knowing what's behind them. So everybody is talking about IoT, but there are very few people who really deeply know what IoT actually is, and probably even less people who are able to set up an IoT system by themselves. So what is IoT? Let's start with the I. I stands for the internet. And this means that if we want to have an IoT system with IoT nodes, then we need processors that can connect to the internet. They must be powerful enough to run the internet protocols. And of course, they must have an in a hardware interface to the internet. And the hardware interface, there are, let's say, three or four different possibilities. You can have an internet interface. You can have a Wi-Fi interface. You can have GSM. 
or last not least, you can have whatever connection to a gateway where the gateway then has got access to the internet. And so the gateway is communicating back the data to your microcontroller. So this is the part for the eye. We will talk about it quite a bit more at the end of this uh, lecture. Now, what are things? Well, things is just about anything. Things are your project. So things can be home appliances like a coffee machine, washing machine, dishwasher, can be a burglar alarm system, intelligent farming, scientific instruments, weather station, industrial factory control. It can be ignition system or ABS in a car. Well, it can be just anything. You name it, things are your project. Now, in order to bring things to the internet, you need sensors and actuators to control or read out the, the, the things. So the pro our uh, processor now needs interfaces to these sensors and actuators, which then give you the state of your things or control your things. Now, I remember that uh, quite a few years back, I saw a, 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 a drawing where you see two engineers standing around a coffee machine with this nice blue screen. I think everybody who has been working on Windows has seen this nice blue screen once. And one of the engineers says to the other, you know, these were the good old times when coffee machines still work without Windows. Well, no, this is, this is what I saw recently. Now we have got, in fact, the coffee machine running Windows. So you see, this is one of the things. In this case, you use Windows to bring your, to, to control your coffee machine. Now the course on Internet of Things, we already saw that, has a series of exercises. And the exercises actually are the, the biggest, let's say, time consuming factor in preparing such a course because you first have to understand the hardware yourself. Then you have to think about what type, of in the, uh, what type of exercises the students can do. Then you have to write the exercise sheets and you have to do the solutions yourself. Now, these are the 12 exercise sessions that we're going to have. The first one, and there's going to be only one that is on standard Python programming. So that is of course very, very uh, short. And it would be very, well, I think it's necessary actually that the students have at least a basic knowledge of Python before. And then we immediately start in, into uh, sensors and actuators. How do we actually access external hardware? And the simplest hardware that you can access are LEDs, for example, or switches. So we have two exercises, one on LEDs, now this is a standard LED and this one is an, uh, an, address an addressable LED. We'll see that in a minute. And then switches, then we have temperature and humidity measurements. Now this device, the DHT11, we already saw in the last lecture. So this is a device that has got a proprietary communications protocol, which then we have to interface to our processor. And the second one is an SHT30, again, temperature and humidity sensor, but this uses a standardized bus, the I2C bus. Then we have one exercise on GPS, which is interfaced to a serial line. We have motors. In fact, motors, we have a DC motor controlled by a motor controller. We have got a servo motor, which you can directly connect to the lines of the, of the CPU. Then we have got uh, a, um, a stepping motor with a stepping motor driver card. Then we have real, uh, real time clock and data logging. Well, data logging, you can take your data and store them on an SD card for a long period and afterwards read them out and treat them. If you want to actually see the data on your, on your uh, uh, IoT node, so on, on the processor, which is sitting close to your equipment, then you also can have TFT displays showing the, the data as they come in or plotting them. 
Okay, so all that part is actually has to do with the interfacing between our processor and the things. And the last two exercises, the first one is on a web server. So in this case, on our IoT uh, node, we have got a web server that you can access from whatever PC or handphone or to whatever you want. And you can get the data like this. And last but not least, we have got IoT via protocol that is called MQTT. And there is a system called Cayenne that allows you to visualize the, the data that, came, that come to it over MQTT from your IoT node. I will show you a little bit of, of all of this. Now, this is how the hardware looks like. On the left-hand side, you see this one is the CPU card. And this one is a sort of a bus system. Okay, and let me see if I can quickly show it to you. Um, here, I stop the share for a minute. Okay, now you see, this is how it looks like. Now, on this side, this one is the CPU card. You have got a USB cable, which you connect to your PC. And then on the left-hand side, this is a, a display card in this case. And the, the things are just plugged together, so I can easily take it out. You see, now that I have them out. And I just plug it in, and by plugging it in, you get the connection to your CPU, and then you can start running your, your program and accessing it. Okay. Share it. Right. Now, there are plenty of, of, uh, of different small actuators and sensor cards. A few of them I show you here. These are actually the ones that we use during the course. So this one is the SHT30 temperature and humidity measurement. This is the THT11, also temperature and humidity measurement. This one is a push button, a few LEDs. Okay, then we have got here, we have got the data logger and the real-time clock. This is a PIR sensor, and this one is a barometric pressure sensor. I think I have a total of 20 or so different cards that you can very easily connect to your to this uh, uh, bus just by just through these connectors that you see here, right? Now the CPU. The CPU is actually quite a powerful beast. It, is a, it has two, two CPUs inside, so it's a dual core machine. And it's a 32-bit power extensor microprocessor. It's an ESP32 microprocessor. It has 512 kilobytes on-chip SRAM. You can add, and the card we have has 8 megabytes of serial RAM. You have 4 megabytes of flash. And then all sorts of interfaces. We have got nice square C interface, I square S interface, that you, which you use for, for audio systems. You have a serial peripheral interface. You have a serial lines, UARTs. You have a 12-bit ADC with up to 16 channels. So this is multiplexed up to 16 channels. You have a, a digital to analog converter. You have a Wi-Fi interface all on the chip. And you have got Bluetooth and Bluetooth low energy. And the whole CPU card costs you about 5.5 euros. So that gives you about the prices of the, of the system that we are looking at. The sensors usually, they are even a lot cheaper. So between one and two euros, you will usually get one of the sensors. Now here you see the pinout. Only these pins here are actually going onto the bus. So these ones, and here you see the ADC, you see the DAC, here you see the SPI, you see plenty of GPIO, general purpose input output lines. Now these lines, you can program input or output and drive or read single, single signals. So here we put the pins to connect to, uh, to our bus, and these ones you can access with individual cables if need, if need be. 
Now, in addition to the CPU and the, sen the sensors and actuators I already showed you, we have those here in addition. We have the three types of motors. So this one is a DC motor, this is a servo motor, and this one is a stepping motor with a stepping motor calf. Well, this one actually also has got a motor driver in addition. And this one is um, a GPS receiver with its, with its an antenna. And here you see it only needs power and ground and the receive and transmit for a serial line to communicate to the, to the CPU. Now, what are the advantages of the system? I think the first advantage is cost. Now, the total cost per station for students, and now I'm talking about the baseboard, the CPU board, all the sensors, uh, 128 by 128 pixel TFD displays, the three motors, the GPS receiver, everything, costs you about 35 euros. So if you take this and you run it for five years, then you would have a cost for the course of about seven euros per year and per student, which is, I think, affordable by just about anybody. I think for this price, actually, even this, the students could buy such a system, take it home, and then play on it at home. The other thing is that on this CPU board, this is powerful enough to run, well, a micro Python, which provides most of the drivers for the hardware. And the network interface is included. We have seen that we have got a Wi-Fi interface. Now, MicroPython. MicroPython is a slightly stripped down uh, Python interpreter, which is based on Python 3.5. And it's dedicated to microcontrollers. You get it through a GitHub repository. So let me just show you quickly. Right, so this is the GitHub place. This is MicroPython. And here you have got a description of the project. And these are all the different types of processors that are on which this MicroPython is running. And as you see, there is one port, which is the ESP32 port, which is what we are using. Now, in order to get this to work, you have to go to the port. You go to ESP32. And here, then, you have got a make file, which allows you to compile uh, all, the, all the MicroPython code, which is to most, most part is written in C. And then what you get is an interpreter that, that then you can load, upload to your, uh, to your ESP32. Documentation is very good. So here you see the documentation. So on the MicroPython, uh, well, it shows you all the libraries. So the different calls that you have in the libraries, you see there are quite, uh, quite a few of them. You also have got one part which gives you all the specific, the specific um, details about the ESP32 and how you control it. You'll see that also a bit more in a minute. However, in order to get all this to work, you need a bit of an infrastructure on your PC to be able to compile MicroPython. What you need is the cross compiler, so the Extensa ESP32 cross compiler. You need the ESP libraries. Now, these are libraries that allow you to access uh, the, the different hardware on the ESP32 chip. And then you need two additional tools. One is called ESP tools, which allows you to erase the flash of your ESP, uh, the ESP32 CPU card and to reprogram it. And then there is one tool, which is called AMPI, or you can also use FTP, to transfer files from your PC to the ESP32 file system. Now, MicroPython exists for a big number of microcontrollers, and the ESP32 is actually one of the most popular ports. And as I already said, the interpreter is written in C. Well, you build. MicroPython using the make file. And then you have a one make target, which is called make deploy, which will then flash 
your newly compiled MicroPython using ESP tool onto your CPU card. MicroPython has a REPL, which is a read, execute, print loop of Python. And this REPL you can access through USB, through a USB to serial uh, adapter combined with a virtual uh, terminal program that you run on your on your PC. So typical such programs is Minicom or GT Capture. Okay, MicroPython can also be accessed over the network and there is a, uh, a web REPL, but this is a bit more complex to set up. And uh, okay, what I did for the course was to build a custom binary of MicroPython, which has all the drivers for all the different sensors and uh, actuators already built in. And this is available on GitHub. Now programs are written on the PC and they are uploading, uploaded to the MicroPython file system before being executed. And this is done with an IDE, an integrated development environment called Tony. Okay, in order to learn MicroPython, I think the best thing is to act, to uh, to go through the micro, to the Python tutorial. So there you have uh, well, some 50 or so pages with plenty of exercises which you can try yourself. And you can try to run Python on your PC, and later on you can take the same code and you can write uh, you can run it on the on the CPU card on the ESP32 CPU. Now, in this first lect in the first exercises, we will write a few simple scripts, Python scripts, using Tony. We can run them on the PC or we can run them on the on the hardware. And as I already showed you, the exercise sheets are available on the Twiki as LibreOffice documents, or they are already they are also there as a website a web uh, page. Right, so how do we talk to the ESP32? Now, if we have a look at, at the CPU card, then you see here we have got a micro USB connector. And we have one of the these normal micro uh, USB cables that you also use for your, for your smartphone. And you use this cable and connect it to, the, um, to your PC. And then you run the terminal emulator and you can talk to this device. So let me see if I can quickly try and do it. In fact, I have here, here you see, let me see, here you see the uh, one of these uh, of these of these uh, bus boards. You have two uh, cards, two sensor cards. Well, this is an LED card. This is the SHD30, and this one is a CPU card. You see, the thing is powered. This is the USB cable that goes to my PC. And now I want to talk to this device here. So what I can do, I can say minicom. Okay. And you see, I'm connected to MicroPython now, right? So we can play a little bit on it. For example, we can try, I don't know, 45 times three plus 23. Uh, 223. You, you can you see you can use it as a calculator. You can also do a little bit more complex thing. You can from uh, better like this. You can say from the math library import sinus and radians. Okay, and then you can say the sinus of radians 32 de 30 degrees. And what you would guess is that you would get 0 0.5, which is what you do. You can also say, let's say, print our famous Hello World program, right? So all this, like this, you can talk directly to your to your um, ESP32. Now, let me go out. No. 
What is it? Okay. Well, I'll do it later. D control control A X. Now I managed to exit it. Okay. So so this is how you would uh, how you would work with the with the um, uh, serial terminal. The other possibility now, of course, for the moment we were just talking to the thing directly, but we want to write programs. And in order to write programs, we need an editor. And the best thing, of course, would be if the the editor would also be able to actually do the uploading and the communication with the uh, ESP32. And this is done with this program called Tony, which you see here. Now, this Tony uh, has uh, certain options where you can uh, define the interpreter that you want to, to use. And one of the options is to have actually the interpreter running on the ESP32. So let me try to do this also. So I try to run Tony here. Perhaps I should go one down. Yes. I use the editor and I try to open help.py, which is, no, it should be hello.py. Anyway, I can open it like this. Open this computer and then Where are we? This computer of OPT. Right. Okay, now you see what I did. I opened this very, very simple Python script. Now this is actually a file on my on my PC. And I was talking about the options. Now, what you see here, if you go to the interpreter, you see that I'm con the interpreter I'm using is actually my MicroPython running on the ESP32. So if now I run this thing like this, you see it prints hello A ASP. And what it actually did, it took this program, it sent it over to the ESP32, it executed on the ESP32, and it got via the serial line the output from the program, which is printed here. So this here is the shell. So this is what we did before. You can, where you can uh, directly talk to the, uh, to the ESP32. And this one is the editor, which allows you to edit your programs and to run them. Right. Now the first few exercises, well, the first exercises are very first ones are just on standard uh, Python. And then these ones are on the first hardware access to external hardware. The simplest one is for LEDs. So a standard LED, there's one LED which we have on the CPU card and you already saw the, uh, the NeoPixel LED chain. Then there is an exercise on switches, the temperature and humidity measurement, the I2C interface, how it works, and uh, we use the SHT30 to do the measurements. Then we have motors and we have got a real time clock. Now, access accessing the external hardware, there are many drivers are already available in MicroPython. There is a driver for the general purpose IO, there's a driver for the NeoPixel, so the uh, pixel. The LED chain. There is a driver for the DHT, uh, the DHT, DHT11. There are drivers for for display. Well, not for the display that uh, we use. Now, this driver I actually had to write myself and include it into the custom version of MicroPython. But there are also a few other uh, programs or let's say modules available in the MicroPython library which is available on GitHub, and you can easily integrate these, this code into 
to your custom build in MicroPython. Now the ESP32 card has got a user LED, which is uh, connected to GPIO, the general purpose IO line 19. Okay, and via this line, you can easily access and test your hardware access. So let's try this again. And let me see if I have, yes. Now let me get rid of this and see if I can improve this a little bit. The problem is that the the light the lighting here in my room is changing all the time. It's, it's, it's quite dark now outside. So what I want to do, there is an, an LED on the CPU card here, and I want to try and talk to it. So what I do, I start, start Minicom again to connect to the ESP32. Okay, now I want to, to get access to this LED. So what I do, I do a from uh, machine import the pin class. Now the pin class is actually the driver for the GPIO. Now the next thing I, I, I do, I define uh, the LED. So the LED now equals, it's on pin 19, and the pin 19 should be an output, right? So now I have defined my LED and I can try to just switch it on. And as you see, the green light goes on and I can switch it off, the green light is going to go off. So you see, it's that easy to actually access the, uh, the hardware, external hardware. Okay. So this is how you access the built-in LED. Now the the um, the LED chain. So that one is a little bit more complicated because we need a different driver, which is the NeoPixel driver. Yeah, but we can also give it a try and see. Now, in order to get this done, the best thing is to get at the documentation. So let's see if we can easily get at the documentation. So here, here we find the description of the NeoPixel driver. Okay, now if I start Tony in this case, let me see. The first thing I, I need to do is to, again, get the pin, right? The next thing I need to get the uh, NeoPixel class, okay? Now I have to define the pin. Now my NeoPixel is connected to pin 26. Pin no, is neo pixel of pin twenty six. No, not to get it right. Pin of twenty six. No. Again, the neo pixel equals. Pin equals pin of 26, and it must be an output. Okay, now let's define the new. So equals new pixel, and I use the previously defined pin, and then the number, I've got seven. Uh, seven LEDs sitting on it. And now what I can try to do is to switch on, for example, the, the, 
the LED zero equals now let's say now what I have to give here is the the RGB the red green blue value so I say zero x f comma zero comma zero which should give me a red LED and let's try to write it and as you can see if I take this here away now the red LED has gone on okay now let me try to make this a little smaller so that you can see now I can switch it off again put that to zero write it it's off I can also now use a different one for example I can use number three and now the third one is going to to go on hopefully ah, I have to of course define a value zero x f now since this one this is r g b so now I should get a green color on the third LED and you see you get a green color on the third LED and so on so you see how how you do the, the hardware access quite easily using the different drivers that are available in MicroPipe. Well, this is this one I need. Okay. Right. So this one is when we use uh, GPIOs. Now, in addition to CP, uh, GPIO, there are different buses. So we have got the I2C bus, for example. And on the I2C bus, we, we have uh, now the SHT30 uh, sensor, which allows us to measure the temperature and humidity. And uh, as I explained last time, the I2C bus is uh, an instrumentation bus where all the different it's a, a master slave bus where the master is always the the cpu the esp32 cpu and the slave are the different sensors and actuators now each of the sensor and actuator has got its address and then you can get by giving the address you can talk to the different devices okay. so the sac30 is a sensor communicating over the i2c bus the, the driver is, is uh, well, there is a driver available on GitHub, but it's, it only uses a small subset of everything that the SAC30 can do. So I extended the driver and put it into, again, the custom version of MicroPython. Okay. Well, sometimes it's necessary to write drivers in C also, which is possible, but this, of course, is quite a bit more tricky. You you will only need this if you are very, very much restricted in time, for example, or if you need to be very efficient otherwise. Okay, let me first still quickly show you the SHT30. So now this time what I'm going to do is to go into the SHT30. And here we have got this program now what this does, it scans the, the whole I2C bus and it tells you about all of the devices that are available on the bus with their corresponding addresses. So now I take, I open the program. Okay. So you see, this is the I2C scanner, right? Now what I do, I run it on the ESP32. And you see that there is one device at address 45, which in fact is my ESP32, which is my, my SHT30 uh, temperature sensor. Okay. Now, if I take the program to read out the SHT32, okay, now here, you will surely some well no the address is actually defined in the driver. So what I do in there, I define here the SHT30 driver. 
And then the SHD third driver has got a method that gets the temperature and humidity, which are transferred into these two variables. And then I simply print them. So if I run this and I do this once per second, and now you see in my room there is 23 degrees and the humidity is about 40%. So, so you can see like this, you can get the uh, sensor values and you can very easily print. Okay. Now the I in IoT. Well, we want to communicate with our, with our IoT node over the internet. And in order to do that, so we have essentially two uh, possibilities. Well, the first thing we need to do, of course, is to connect the node to the, to the network. And then we can provide either a web server or we can communicate via the MQTT and, uh, well, the I MQTT protocol to whatever, uh, whatever um, server that will take the MQTT messages. Okay, so connecting to the network. Now, what I did there, in fact, it is not very complex. You see, there are just a few lines which allow you to define a Wi-Fi station, to activate it, to connect it, to, to connect to your SSID and password, and then you will, you can find the uh, the IP address that has been assigned to your IoT uh, IoT node. Now this is something that you need very very often, and for this reason I have written a, a little uh, a little module that will allow you to do to do that even more easily by just a single command that will then connect to your to the network. Okay. So this module, it's called Wi-Fi Connect. So what I do, I, I include everything from Wi-Fi Connect. I say connect. And once this is, this is done, then the connection to the network is going to be done. Let me see if we can do that here. No, this is this one. OK. Let's go to the web server. Well, actually, I can do it directly. I can just call Tony. So let me try here. And what I said, I need to do from Wi Fi connect, import everything, and then I simply say connect. Well, as you see, it's already connected, so there is nothing to be done. If I reset the if I reset the board, I can try to do that. Import machine machine reset. So now I reset the machine, and I have to do the same thing I did before once more. Well, Home Wi-Fi connect import star and do connect. Now it's activating the station. It found that there are four access points. It's it's connecting to it, and you see connection was successful. And this is my IP address that I will have to talk to afterwards. Okay. Right, now the first thing I want to do is to show you how to write a simple web server. Now, MicroPython has already a socket interface, so a socket class for network access. And with a socket class, that is actually all that is needed to implement a simple web server. Now, to make things even simpler, a basic framework is already available, which is called PicoWeb, and it's available on GitHub. And this Pico web, I again integrated into the MicroPython binary to make it globally accessible. So let's try and see how this looks like. OK. 
Okay. Right. Well, the simplest thing I do, I have. And you see, now this is my Hello World HTML. So here you see the body, you see a title, you see that it's a, a header and it prints some text and that's about it. So a very, very simple HTML page. Now, how can we serve this? Let's see if I start, Tony. Okay, again, you see I connect to the network. Then I have an application, which is this Pico Web. And I start Pico Web like this. And when, I, when somebody is looking at my web server and he takes the, the root of the web server, then I will simply send the file HTML, hello world.html back to the browser. Okay, let me see if I run this. Okay, now the web server is started. Now what we need is a browser and it started on this address here. So I give it 192 and this is 45. Well, this must be one. And you see the web page is coming out. Now this web page is actually now sent by our IoT node by the ESP32. Now this is a static HTML page, so it doesn't really do very much. And what we really want is to, to have, a, instead of just having a static page, we want to have a data that are coming from our, from our sensors. So let's see if we can do that. go on to the SHT30 and let's try to run this this uh, modified web server. Now in this modified web server now, I have to stop it. Okay. On this modified web server, now you see I'm again talking to the SHT30. I'm getting the temperature and I'm sending the temperature over now to the, to the browser. And I sort it into a template, which then together with the, with the timestamp, which I already pick up here from the local time that I have on my IoT node. Let me see if I can run it. So I think there I have to restart it. Okay, let's try it and see what happens. It's the same address, so I just have to reload it. And now you see, I have got the current temperature, I've got the humidity taken at that moment. So I have the data that come from the sensors and I have them on my web page. Now it's still not perfect because what I need to do in order to get something new, you see, I always have to, to update it. Let me see. Oh, now the connection is timed out. Okay, I have to retry it. Maybe better to restart it. Well, that is the problem when you do when you do uh, demos. So we'll, we'll see later on if if uh, we can come back to that. 
fights. So in fact, what you would get, no, what you get is this thing here. So you have the you have the the time, and you have got the measurements that that you have taken with your sensors. Now, in addition, what you can do, the problem is with, with this page is that each time that you want a new measurement, you have to update the whole page. However, there is also a possibility, but now you need a bit of web programming actually in JavaScript, which will allow you then to take periodic measurements. So make a measurement every second or so. And this is done with so-called server-side events. I'll try again if this is going to work. If not, then we simply go on to the next. We'll see. So. And let's run it. Okay. So let's give it another try. One nine two one point forty five. Well, unfortunately, it seems that now I have got some network problem. Okay, so you you will have to believe me that normally here you would actually now get the, get the data periodically. So this must be a problem on that I have here on the on my on my network at the moment. Right. So let's let's go and have a look at MQTT, which is a different type of of, uh, of protocol, named the message queuing telemetry and transport. Now this corresponds to actually three programs. So you have got a broker, which is a sort of a post office. Then you have got one machine which is subscribing, and then you have one machine that is going to publish. So the way this is working is that if let's say you have got a sensor, then here you would have a, a for example, a, a program in a browser that would take the data. And here you would have your, got your sensor that is read out and this sensor data is then going to be published to this broker. Now, everybody who is interested in the information well, on, a certain, on a certain topic, You'll then get the data and will receive the data and you can do with the data whatever you want. You can print them, plot them, and so on and so on. Right? So you see the way this is working. Here you see three windows. Now this one is oh, sorry. This one here is the broker, Mosquito. This one here is the guy who is subscribing. Now here I subscribe I sub subscribe. This DCSIT, this is the topic. And here I have got the publisher. Now he's, he's the guy who is sending the data to the broker. The broker will then pass it on to everybody who is interested in this information and send it there. Okay, we'll again try to do that. Well, I don't know what this means here. Let's try if I can do it here. So we do this. Let's start mosquito here. Okay, now I need a new window. Now I subscribe to a topic. 
So I say mosquito. No, I don't remember. Underline subscribe minus P ASP twenty twenty, for example. I think it's an underline, but we'll see. Yes. Now you see. This one, this uh, uh, guy here has now subscribed to a topic which is called ASP 2020. And the broker has seen this uh, the subscription. And now what I need to do here is to send the data. So I do a mosquito publish minus T. So that is the topic to ASP 2020. And I send a message either. Now, this here, oops, uh, the, this message here has now gone to the broker. The broker goes through his list of, uh, uh, of subscribers. He sees that this guy here has subscribed and he sends the message on to, uh, to this, um, well, to the subscriber. Now like this, you can imagine, well, actually all, all these uh, the communications are all done through, uh, through uh, sockets. And since they are done through sockets, it's not necessarily on the same machine as I do it here, but you can do it on any, on any machine and my subscriber or my uh, publisher can actually be on an IoT node. Okay, so this is how it would how it would look like then on the on the ESP32. Now in this case, I have got my MQTT client. Now the MQTT client is is then subscribing uh, is then the publishing to a topic that is called DCIT. The payload, this is the information that is going to be sent. Oops. And after the connection, after the connection to the, the broker, the data is sent to the corresponding to the corresponding uh, well, subscribed client. Like this, you can take any information. Now, this is normally text information that is sent back and forth. And your, your IoT node can, like this, send whatever it, measure, whatever it measured, for example, on sensors to whoever is interested in this sort of information. Now, this was done with the, for the publisher. You can do the same thing for a client. Now, in this case, you would you would uh, subscribe to the corresponding topic, which is done, here's the topic. Here we connect to the client and here we subscribe to the topic. And whenever anything comes on, the, on this topic, then this routine here is called and then you can do within this routine whatever needs to be done. Now Cayenne is a program that uses uh, MQTT and Cayenne claims to be the world's first drag and drop IoT builder. Now it uses, it provides an MQTT broker and it uses its own protocol on top of MQTT for message passing. Now, in addition to the broker itself, it also supplies a dashboard so that you can use widgets to graf graphically represent measured parameters. Now this can be, the programs can be written in C, C++, the Arduino IDE, or you can also do it in Python. Now, the first thing you need to do is of course re registering. And when you register, then you get an MQTT username and you get an MQTT password. Now these are big numbers if you want. After that, once you have done that, then you get a page like this. 
where you can define your IoT node. Now in our case, well, it can be a Raspberry Pi, it can be an ESP32. In this case, well, normally this is done with the, with the Arduino IDE. If you don't have any of these, then you can say, okay, I bring my own thing, and then you can program the, the, the code uh, yourself. What you get is the MQTT username. Now here, this is a big number. You get the MQTT password and you get a client ID. Now this is for every I uh, IoT node, you get an ID and you talk then to your, via this client ID to your corresponding node. All this information is sent over to, um, to, to Cayenne and Cayenne then does the, 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 the security that is needed to, to access. So it takes these numbers and it checks if you are the right user, you have the right password, and you have got the right uh, uh, user ID. Now this is how it will look like in the end. So you have got here the temperature and humidity measurements. Here you have got the measurements over a longer period. And finally, I also have got an actuator to, to control my, uh, my IoT. A node. I can try again if for whatever reason this is working better now. Let's see. So let me try to. I don't know why this, this gets. You know. So if I take. I log into Cayenne. Okay, now this is how, how it will look like afterwards. So let me see, I have the, this is no, this is the IoT course here. Hmm. Why does it not come back? Here we go. Okay, so this is the IoT course. Now, if I run this again. Now, in fact, I do have a problem on my network at the moment. So what will happen normally is that the IoT node makes a connection to my uh, Cayenne de uh, to my Cayenne uh, desktop here. And then the data are going to be sent over and put up into these, into these uh, widgets here, where then you see the corresponding numbers that have been measured by, uh, by, the, uh, by the sensors. And here you will normally see a time evolution of, of the data. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, I have a, a network problem at the moment, so I cannot, I cannot demonstrate this to you any longer. Okay. So the question is, what next? Now from here, the, the next thing that I want to do is to bring actually this IoT course now to life. Now I think that my job has essentially been done. Now what I have to do is to push my Ghanaian collaborators to check all the exercises and the solutions and to write the next slides. Now this is not so easy. Uh, I tried to, well, they, they started to work on the exercises, but at the moment the work is again stalled. I don't know why, well, so we'll see if the cause is actually really happening 
uh, during the next semester as I, as I hope it will be done. Then the next thing will be to try and see if we can promote the courses to other universities and bring a few more people on board and establish collaborations between the different uh, people running this course. This would be extremely helpful because at the moment there are, there's only uh, the UCC who is, who is uh, working on this course. So a few more people would really, would really help. And then we would create new exercises and new lab projects. Now, very often I've been asked, uh, can I have this course in this university? And uh, well, I would like to have it, but I simply cannot afford it because I don't have the budget. Now, I have showed you that the hardware only costs about 35 euros. And if you amortize it over five years, then you come down to only seven euros per student per year, which is really, really low. However, the problem is that about six months of full-time work have gone into the course. And I estimate that somebody who wants to give the course at the university will take another at least four to six months to go, through, to go through everything, to write the slides, and to make sure everything is ready for the, for the students. And this is where the main problem lies. Okay. So the exercises, solutions are there. The lecture slides still must be written. Okay, and I think I probably better stop here. So this is a, a new project that I will go into. The, in fact, the, there is now a new IoT node, if you want, with the same type of processor, where everything is plugged into a, into a box, which is, which is actually a sort of a, a watch, which you can program yourself. But there is a lot, a, a lot of work that needs to go into, into this sort of uh, well, new IoT node. OK, I think I will stop here. Thank you. And Lee. see if there is still anybody around, yeah. and if there are any questions. Yeah, are there questions for Eli? So from from my side, Uli, I, I mean, I'm definitely going to give it a try. That's uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I I haven't uh, had the luxury of playing around with uh, with hardware in quite some time, so. Okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely going to do your shopping list and, and get going, yeah. So, Uli, um, I mean, this is really, really nice. So we have to see, um, you know, how we can integrate this in the, uh, in the upcoming uh, the editions of the African School and how to get you back to the school. Uh, we miss, <laughs> well, we this miss is, you in this Namibia. Is <laughs> Online so, it's okay, but uh, otherwise it's a bit more difficult, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but we have to try for the next time. So one question I have for you is uh, for the, when you were at Cape Coast, um, did the university or the government uh, actually do anything about these seven euros per, per year for, for five years for the students to in order to get these equipment? Well, well I, I said last time that uh, the, the way I actually came to, uh, to Cape Coast. You see, I, I started off with courses I gave at the, uh, at the ICTP in Trieste. So I started with microprocessor courses in the early 80s. And uh, I did this, well, the, the course was really extremely successful and we run it for about 35 years, always updating it to the very newest technology. And one thing we did was to take the best students and uh, integrate them into the course as lecturers. Mm -hmm. And one of these students, uh, four former students, is actually a, Ghan a Ghanaian who, who studied in the US at Stony Brook, who, who worked at Digital Equipment Corporation. And uh, then uh, at a certain moment in time, he said, I go back to my country and I try to bring uh, my knowledge back to Ghana. And this is what he did. So he set up uh, a network uh, provider company. Uh, at that time, at the was about mid 80s or so, the internet Ghana was just him. That's it. Okay. And uh, he did a lot, a lot of work on, on uh, internet uh, um, facilities in all West Africa. So he's very, very well known 
in, in the country. And he was actually the guy who asked me if I could come. And he pulled all the strips in the background, right? And now the, the new course, the, the seven euro uh, course, I think uh, he actually paid the, uh, the equipment. Now you can calculate it's 35 multiplied by 15. This is, this is what, it, what, uh, what the whole course is going to cost. Now the, the uh, UCC and my colleague at UCC has already all the hardware. So everything is ready from the hardware point of view, but uh, it's mainly a preparation problem because uh, you, know, you, you cannot just, if you have written three lines of Python, then you are not ready to give this type of course. And uh, I think what, if I see how long time my colleague will take, I, I would guess it will take about six months to, well, or even longer until he is really ready to, to give it. What I've, showed, what I've shown now is actually only a part of the, of the whole course. There are other exercises. There are exercises on the motors. There's exercises on, on, uh, on GPS where you can get your, your GPS location, where you can do the timing and so on and so on. So there's a lot more stuff, but you have to go through everything. You have to understand all the different sensors. You have to read the data sheets, right? I mean, a data sheet of one of the centers, you can imagine it's about 60 pages of, of text that you have to go through and understand and test and, and so on and so on. So this is where, where the problem lies. Would it help, for instance, if you had a, a library of solutions somehow in yes, terms of, of applied? Because I guess that it might be as well a way to motivate and then you could have a different... Uh, um, I mean, different uh, discipline or different uh, area where they would then look at that. Huh? And then yeah. once you find a way to attract them, then you can really get out of that. And they have funding coming from very diverse origin, I guess. And it yeah, you're, right, you're right, Christine. But, but you see, there are two things. There, there is what, what the students need to see, and there is what the lecturers need to know. And this is something different, it's right? Completely. Agreed. Now, in fact, for the students, everything is ready. So you have got uh, a Python version, a custom Python version, with all the drivers, everything already built in. The documentation of the drivers is there. So what they need is to just import the driver, and then they have a few commands, and with a few commands, they can do everything. right? And in the background, in the driver itself, all the access is made. However, in order to bring everything up and running, I think that the lecturer needs to know how the driver is working, mm. you see? And he should be able to write his own driver and include it into, into, the, into the binary. Mm. And that is a different story. Mm. Yeah, I'm not really familiar with the electronics engineering community in Africa, but there must be some kind of I don't know, a network of teachers or something like this, no? I don't, I don't know. know. My, I know mm -hmm. I have a, quite a few contacts. Yeah. I have contacts to a different uh, Ghanaian university, and mm -hmm. I have uh, contacts to, uh, to the University Andadiop in uh, Sheikh Andadiop in Senegal, in Dakar. Mm -hmm. right. Actually, via, via our friend uh, Umar Ka. Ah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, We'll see there is one person there, and uh, one of the, the next projects is actually taking the, all, all the, uh, the web pages, the, the Twiki pages, and translate them into French, and uh, set them up in Dakar, and then they will try also to see if they can run such a, such a course. Mm. So we'll see what is going to come out of that. Of course, if you have it, if you have all the information in English and in French, that would help quite a bit, mm -hmm. at least for at least for French speaking countries. Mm -hmm. But as I said, the main to me the main problem is now that uh, the the lecturers they really go through all of the exercises, they check them, they they check the text, they they check if it's doable by for the students, maybe. You know, give a bit more, a bit more help 
even than I have been doing. But as I said, all the code is there, all the, the solutions are there. You can just download them and run them. So, you know, there's not much more that I, I can do. You can do, but indeed, this is, uh, it's all in the hands of the, the teacher as well, or the professor. Of course. Yeah. Well, you have to imagine that you, that in the IoT, six months of more or less full-time work has gone in mm -hmm. to prepare everything. And the embedded systems course is the same thing. So the IoT course builds on the embedded systems uh, course. And so everything I learned from the embedded systems, I could put immediately plug into the IoT course. Right. So Uli, I think um, in 2018, we uh, when we had a school in Namibia, we we bought um, a number of uh, uh, Raspberry Pi version three, on yes. which we did uh, some exercises uh, uh, specifically for, for 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 teachers. Yes. Um, and then at the end, uh, at the end of the school, we basically donated uh, this uh, equipment and all of the software that came with it uh, to the University of Namibia. Um, so the Raspberry Pi did some of the things uh, similarly to what, what you did. Uh, uh, once it was uh, installed and, and, and configured properly, which we spent a lot of time doing and, and in addition to uh, having uh, experts here connected to their experts at the university and, uh, and and making sure that all of the little hard words uh, 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 you know are bought and they are consistent with each other because some of the cables we realize that they, you know the the tool that's one thing when we bought, bought some equipment and eventually when we got there it didn't fit and <laughs> <laughs> we have to scrum to find a solution. But yeah, I, yeah, this, I guess, this, this yeah. is why, you know, I mean, I, I did the same. The, the first course was actually based on the Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to have a look at it, everything is, is documented on, on the Tweaky. Now, the Tweaky is something I think that is very, very nice and very important. Yeah. So all the information is there. So you can very easily add something. You can you can add uh, code, you can add uh, pictures, you can, you know, and so everything I put, I put there. So anybody can access it and you can even give to, well, you can give to your lectures or even to your students, right access to the, to the Tweaky. And it's essentially typing. So there is nothing special about it. And immediately it's available on the web, right? That is very, very, very cheap. Yeah, I, I, my question is uh, between the Raspberry Pi and, you know, what is the difference here? Why did you move away from the Raspberry Pi? Is there... Do you, well, is why that... I moved away from the Raspberry Pi is... Cheaper. It has to do with the, uh, with the goal. I mean, the goal was this time to, to do an IoT. So in the, the, the Internet of Things. Okay. And if you do the Internet of Things, then the price of the processor must be in a reasonable relation to the price of the sensors or of the things if you want, right? So for example, if you do a, a system, an IoT system for agriculture, where you measure humidity, air temperature, air, uh, wind speed and things like this, then a single, let's say a single uh, station will cost you perhaps, I don't know, $50 or so. So you cannot put $100 for a Raspberry Pi in there. You have to put something that is in relation to the, the hardware that you're using. So try to make it as cheap as possible. And this processor is by far enough to, to run the, these sort of programs, right? Mm -hmm. I've never come to, uh, to a limit in resources on this type of processor. Now the, the Raspberry Pi has the, the big advantage that you can do everything natively. But as you have seen, if you use one of the IDEs, you hardly see a difference because when you run the program, everything, you know, the uploading and the running on the, uh, on the node is sort of automatic. So 
there's no, nothing that we have to do. Well, other people have questions, especially the students, yeah? Uh, they should tell us who has the ability to look into these things or at the Institute. Um, maybe, Uli, you, you can comment a little bit. Um, I think some of the, some of it doesn't require really internet access. You can have maybe they generate their local network or something. Is yeah. that correct? I think that's what we saw with the Raspberry Pi. Once everything is installed there, it can just be some sort of intranet uh, that doesn't really require access to the, to the rest of the world. Yes. Because that's usually uh, uh, where some of the difficulty may come in when 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 people don't have good internet uh, connectivity or, or uh, upload or download uh, bandwidth. But here, yeah. once you have everything installed, you really don't need to go to the outside world world unless you need to download another library or something. Yes, that is true. Yes. I think for if you well we, we have the we have we used to have the the tricky page the tricky pages locally, and since everything when when we did the embedded systems course everything was on the on the server at the university, and we could very easily then access it. Now we wanted to uh, to give global access to at least the the, the tricky and the GitHub pages. And then, of course, you need the internet. You need uh, yes. mm -hmm. I think they, I mean, you know, some of the other people connected that you guys should have a lot of questions uh, uh, for Uli. Yeah, I'm curious if you guys managed to do any of this kind of hardware in your labs at the university. Um, at least when, when I was at um, University, I, I didn't do this stuff. I did it more when I um, later in my, at graduate school. I didn't do it um, in undergraduate. I don't know if it was just because I, of the, my university or if it was just, um, you know, I mean, we did other things in the lab, but it was much more kind of classical mechanics and <laughs> rolling balls and pendulums and things like this. <laughs> anyway. Well, I personally saw that uh, well, when, when I was at, at UCC, you know, I was at the Department of, of Computer Science, mm. and uh, I chatted with quite a few uh, of the lecturers there. I mean, I knew everybody in the end. And I must say, I was very surprised and almost shocked by, let's say, the, the experience that uh, some of the people have, which is extremely low. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw, for example, the, the lecturer giving the C++ course. He essentially, what he did, he took a book, and uh, what he found in the book, he put on the whiteboard with 150 people in the class. And none of the students have ever written a single line of C++ code during a one semester C++ course. I mean, can you imagine? You know, I mean, the, these students, when they came then to, to the class where we did a, a, a bit of C programming, but C programming with external hardware, at the, at the beginning, they, they were really completely lost. So it took me, you know, I, I remember the first time, you know, when I gave an exercise. So I gave them the, the exercise and I said, okay, you have to, to make this lead uh, drink. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took it and then they were there and they're waiting for, for half an hour. And after half an hour, they came back and said, but where's the solution? You know, they were used that the professor gives an exercise and after the exercise, he puts down the solution on the, on the whiteboard and then the thing's done. So when I told them, well, the solution is you who write it, that that was something that was new to them, you know? So that, to my mind, the, the practical part, and this is really the main part in, in these type of, uh, of courses, is extremely important. This is where, where people learn. So, so this is from the, from the university, but would you know, maybe Anne would know, in, in South Africa, are there any kind of clubs, electronic clubs or 
or places where it's not only students, so that could be as well a place where they can buy some of those equipment and somehow be then connected to the university. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure. I'm sure there are. I, I mean, I, I think the entrepreneurial side of 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 South Africa is very, very strong. I have some friends um, who would know, and I and I can ask them. Um, but going, at, let's say, just as a comment for for Uli's question. I mean, okay, when I was a, a TA in the US, 15, 20 years ago now, <laughs> um, I think that there is. Um, there is a, a change. Um, at least I found that the students wanted demonstrations. Yeah. They feel they've paid their money and they want to be entertained or they, they want to have a demonstration. There's less, okay, I, in particular, the, you know, the, the pre-meds, for example, were, mm -hmm. were terrible. I mean, it was like, it was like they, were test, they were grading your demonstration rather than trying to figure out for themselves the solutions. Um, and that was quite surprising to me. And on the, on the South African side, I found um, the students less demanding, more eager to figure out the, things for themselves, mm -hmm. actually, than the students that, that, um, that I came into contact with in the US. Of course, the top students, it's a different story. The top students are, are inquisitive and, um, and well-motivated. But the average student, um, you have the impression that they feel they've paid their money and now they want to see see a show um so i think maybe it's a mentality thing um uh, i don't know i'm not sure i i just want to say i don't think it's i don't think it's only I, okay that of course in contrast in the in the u.s you have excellent lecturers of course but um i think that might also just be a um, a move towards a passive way of thinking you know with this information load and and the cell phone giving you passively information all the time that mm. um, that maybe people are less inclined to really do things from the ground up a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, but you know, I mean, the the universities or the the, the professors that I have been talking to, and there were quite a few because when mm. I was at the African Internet Summit. You know, there were, there were people from industry, but there are plenty of people from academics from yeah. different countries. And I haven't seen a single one who would tell me we have got a computing lab where the students can actually work. Okay. These sort of things. <laughs> and and uh, as I said, always, I always had to say the same answer, we, we don't have the money for it. And mm. then I, when I said, you know, I mean, if you take a Raspberry Pi, it, it's a bit more expensive. Let's say it costs you 120 or 100, 100 dollars or so. Well, if you have it for five years, it comes down to 20. I mean, if you cannot afford 20 dollars per student per year, then I think you should shut, shut down your university. I'm sorry. Mm. Well, it's, um, unfortunately, in, in, you know, it's not that they cannot afford it. It's <laughs> It's, it's the fact that uh, nobody knows sometimes where, how the funds are used and, and, and so forth. I, I completely agree with you. They, they can afford it, but it's just that uh, it's more an issue of mismanagement. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's in fact, it, I mean, what, what I have seen also, you know, the, in the physics department at UCC, they had five Raspberry Pis, five of them. And you know where they were? They were in drawers. Mm -hmm. And they were in drawers because they didn't have the power supplies to them, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous because a power supply costs you $2, right? So you just have to order them. But, but the problem is, even if they have the, the Raspberry Pi or they have one of these devices that I'm showing today, then they don't have the people who can actually, you know, who, who know enough about them to give a course on them. That is the main problem. Uh, at the at the uh, university where I was, I wouldn't know a single lecturer who would who would be able to build such a course from scratch. You know, so for them, therefore, I mean, since I, I built the, the lab with them, at least they have got a lab that they can work now, and they do uh, a few small small projects for the end of study projects and, and this sort of thing. 
but uh, you know to set it up by themselves to go into the market to have a look what the different devices are how much they would cost how they fit together what you can do with them and then build a course out of it i don't i don't know many who are able to do that yeah that's right i think um that's uh, an area of development uh, which we have to emphasize, especially since uh, um, all of these uh, all of these uh, technical tools are uh, miniaturized. They are getting cheaper and they are extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. um, it should really help uh, in the edu educational aspects uh, and. Uh, and I, I, I really believe that uh, there is, you know, the education is really lacking in that area. I can, I can, I can show you a lot of African students who can solve complicated <laughs> math mathematical systems of equation, but, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, you know, the, the technical education is, uh, is, is really uh, in this improvement. I know. And there is a, and there is somebody saying, okay, I would like to have this sort of course. I have now, there's another university in Ghana who, uh, well, the, the, the person, the vice uh, chancellor, he, he used to be the, the dean at the, at the school where I was. So he, he knew me and uh, he, he got in contact to me and said, okay, we would like to have something similar at my new, new university now. So I told them, this is fine. Uh, I can help you, but in order to make it sustainable, I need at least one or two people in your university who are actually doing the work. They, they do the work together with me. If they have questions, I'm there, I can answer, no problem. But they do the work and not me. Because if they do the work, then the whole thing becomes sustainable. Otherwise, if you go there and you give a course, everybody says, oh, it's fantastic, it's nice. And a year later, everything is gone. Yeah, that's, we have seen that from, for example, this Raspberry Pis that we donated to the University of Namibia. <laughs> it, will be, it will be good to see what exactly uh, has been done with it. I mean, oh, you know, there was a complete system of uh, of uh, small uh, exercises and demonstration with all of the software that were passed on in addition to to the hardware. Um, but you know, it's. I guess we have to follow up on that to see how well it is being used. Mm -hmm. um, you know that it doesn't; it's not collecting dust somewhere on the shelves. Yes, yes, <laughs> so, exactly. So, um, remember in Senegal as well the computer. So not speaking about the Raspberry, but the computer as well, or all those different donations. So I think it would be interesting to do a follow up, as you said, um, just to try to understand and then to to see how potentially. I mean, we could improve it or maybe give less or give more of different type of, uh, of, uh, of equipment. Or to try potentially to, to provide all the different equipment that uh, Uli was speaking about together with these online courses. And this would be as well some possibility for them to start and to have a, uh, an all-inclusive uh, course somehow. Yeah, well, you know, having the hardware, having the software, having everything is one thing. Understanding it is another. So they first have to go through really the material and understand what the material is doing. And they have to go through the libraries. They have to, to go through everything. They have to go through the demos and so I mean, I have to do the same thing, right? If, if I get a new card, you have a good a, a new module, then I have to go through the thing exactly the same, the same way as they have to. I mean, I may have quite a bit more experience than they have. And this is, I think, where help from, from my side can come in. So, you know, I'm sitting there for, for the moment. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting that, that they sent me a question and so I can help them. Now, my colleague in Ghana, I can tell you, he started to, to work on it. Normally, the semester would have started by mid of September. And we started in May. Okay, and I said, if you go through the exercises one by one, one exercise every week, then you will just make it until September. Well, now we are October and he's about at 30% of the exercises. Mm -hmm. And not a single slide is written. Okay. So for this semester, 
can forget it. Yeah, yeah. I think um, 